segue to number four, Tyler, if you have that, that one by chance in front of you or Kate, uh, because um, that for me is the fastest way to lose with me is the same thing is the is the, the storytelling and, yeah. and victims. So number four is have an ownership attitude. Take full responsibility for your projects, your communication and your actions. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. And a lot of the, like the thing is, you don't see it like I there's and the thing is like I'll have a victim mentality on something I don't even realize I have yeah, I remember did, I did yeah. hiring with hiring people I'm like well you know I'm just not no nah, that's no nah, I'm not going out doing what I need to do in order to get good at it yeah <laughs> so yeah that's totally a big one it is it, it, it's um, it, it's one of the flaws um, <laughs> that we have is that we're conditioned almost because of consequences in telling the truth at times Right is when we don't have the safe space to admit um, that we didn't uh, that we didn't do what we said we would do either because we were overcommitted, we're uh, we're under um, underskilled or underknowledged, um, or we're afraid of the consequences. Oftentimes, um, when we when we make excuses or don't take responsibility for the um, actions and for the outcome, it's. It's something we've it's baggage we've carried with us since we were little children, I think. Yeah. And um, and so how I try to uh, how I uh, how I try to catch myself and others is um, I think the word excuse is the you know two weeks ago we talked about words mm-hmm. and the word excuse has a negative connotation to it where people think that excuses are pretty cut and dry they're clear like most of the time when you're making an excuse for something it's like blatantly obvious right. But when you tell, but when we tell stories, <laughs> that's when we're telling the story to ourselves to listen to our own bullshit. Yeah. And so for me, the fastest way to lose with me is to tell stories because I just have to assume that if you're telling a long story about something with a really short answer, that it just didn't happen. And like why it didn't happen, I don't care. I actually care more about the fact that you told yourself a story than you did about it yeah. not actually doing it because having it not be done won't fix it. Right. Which goes back to one of our other things is having a results being results driven. Yeah. The the story doesn't matter what the outcome of that story is what matters. That's right. And sometimes like here's the thing is I don't do everything I say I'm going to do. Yeah. And and the faster I can accept. Right. (laughs) The faster I the faster we can accept that we that that we're all infallible working towards upholding more of the commitments that we make every day. Um, is the faster we can get comfortable with saying is telling no stories about why we committed to something that either we were unable or unwilling to deliver on. I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't change the outcome as long as we, if we tell a story, sometimes it makes it more understandable. Yeah. Like I was going to do something last weekend. Lauren's plane caught on fire. Yeah. It was not on my calendar to have her mid flight plane, um, have a cabin fire. Um, it's a great story. It dera- right? But it derailed <laughs> my ability to get done what I had committed to getting done at that time. Right. So no excuses. Should have gotten it done. Life yeah. showed up. Yeah. That does. I was going to add to um, responsibility equals blame is one of the se- is like the first section in this. But oh. um, I think it would. I think. Um, what you've got highlighted here, I thought was interesting. And I think it's like a really important differentiator between people that kind of get this or not. But um, while it's sort of, um, admitting when you've made a mistake and setting it right, it also means taking credit for something you've done well. It means owning something and making it yours, both the good and the bad. Um, do you do that? I, I do think you, I do any of you guys actually take credit when you do things well? That's what I was going to say. I, no. I'm really good at taking blame or like <laughs> I taking take blame the, yeah, and like I don't take the credit bad. when, yeah. yeah. I tried to deflect, hey, you know. I am one of the world's greatest at taking blame. Yeah, I'll take but. the blame all day, but I never <clears throat> want to take credit, which I think it's like, well, why? And I think it's. Probably it is interesting, important. right? Because that makes me wonder like, is it less fulfilling to take credit for yourself? Like, do you, do we actually just all want someone else to acknowledge it and give us credit for it? 
Yeah, I think that takes the fun that out. But when I'm, when I'm saying, "Hey, look yeah," because you definitely <laughs> wanted me to acknowledge the other day your spreadsheet that you built. Yeah, right? I like, was upset. Yeah, and so <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, I learned in that moment, though, the difference that I was oblivious to, which is that exact thing, which is giving credit when someone when someone worked hard on something that they want credit for in an organization. And like I did it when Lauren's plane caught fire. Um, I, she called and I said, "Here's how I'll." I went, I went right into like problem solving mode that yeah. was, okay, then here's what, here's the, here's the problem. Here's the solution. How would you like me to solve it? Here are some choices. This is what I'm going to do if I don't, if you don't pick an outcome. Yeah. She didn't want me to do that actually at that time. Actually, she wanted me to just actually like be, in, be in, present and empathetic and acknowledge the the feeling that was needed in that moment the same way that you did with that spreadsheet right and there's nothing wrong with that by the way i do the same thing uh, i just wonder if as a as leaders if that's actually something that we all need to improve on yeah um my therapist just taught me that this week <laughs> about about the whole because i'm capped and save them so, oh yeah so um instead of like throwing out like this is how i'm gonna how i'm gonna fix this just saying hey do you need help with that you know, just start there. So I'm, yeah. I'm pretty horrible at that. I think it has something to do too with being able to trust the people that are working with yeah. you. Um, they talk about trust in this uh, section and part of taking greater responsibility and ownership is building trust with your team and your entrepreneur. And what's about, and the thing with trust is um, when it's given, you work really hard to be worthy of it. And I thought that was kind of something that stood out for me as well in this, um, because it is something where it's like, if somebody's trusting you to take on a task, we're just trusting your judgment on something. You do want to actually, your actions, you want to like have them reflect what you're trying to like take care of. Yeah. Um, and then you can encourage the entrepreneur to trust you by not making assumptions. Instead ask, what do I need to know in order for this project to be a success? And that's the thing, too, is that, like, you know, somebody has to may ask questions. You know, we talked about it last week, Tyler, is that communication is a, is a two-way street. There is the sender and the receiver. Right. And it is not exclusively the sender's responsibility to ensure that communication has actually occurred. The receiver has a responsibility to provide feedback to ask questions, to gain the clarity that's needed in order to accomplish what a responsibility they've been given. And so what I hear is, is that's a fantastic question is what does this look like when it's done and done well? Because sometimes the person who's communicating doesn't actually know. Yeah. Well, especially you, if they're an entrepreneur. I just did it with you earlier when we were prepping and I said, I said a generic term and, yeah. and there was a, there's a disconnect. We talked about this, your face stops a clock or your beauty <laughs> transcends time, yeah. right? We're saying the same exact thing, but I'm using different words. You do an excellent job, Eric, saying I, what I heard you say is this. So I can say something and then you share with me what you heard. Yeah. So then there's no breakdown in the communication. Normally that doesn't happen. I say what I say and then you hear it and it may not, I may have said your face stops a clock. <laughs> well, I'm terrible at communi as being the sender or at least oftentimes I think that I am. Um, and that's, that's certainly feedback that I get um, is that <laughs> being the sender is not one of my strengths. I, I see, I see a end result and an abstract ambiguous outcome. I don't see all the steps to get there. Someone like Kate sees the steps to get there. Someone like Kate, all and who, if she's a receiver, may have to extract those steps or extract clarity to the end result. But but it's not a it's not exclusively a one way street for the for the sender to be solely responsible for doing that. Yeah, I think there's like a couple of things to that. Um, I think when you are working with any like big thinking entrepreneur. I know Eric, like when we are driving or when we're just on one of our phone calls, we do have a lot of times where it's like, we're kind of like imagining a big picture of like what could be something. And so I think it is important to try to break that down because a lot of times I, I know for myself, I think out loud. Yeah. And so especially on our phone calls, well, yeah. I, like I, I think sometimes it's just more of a, a, a thought experiment phone call more than anything where mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, but then it leads to something and then we're able to kind of 
something will come from it. Um, and also going back to asking back or to asking kind of, well, mirroring is the term that I, yeah. I learned in therapy was it works in rela- It works really well for relationships because you want to be able to mirror what your partner is saying. Otherwise you might just assume how they feel about something yeah. or just because you would feel some way about that. Um, in reality, it might be something different. My experience has been that not everyone's able to do that well, though. So what is the what is the effective um, tools or keys to being able to mirror um, effectively, you think? And maybe Kate's the, the better one for that. Well, um, a lot of what, what Michael said, you did well. That's why Tyler and I were both looking at each other, because we were, like, mirroring. Uh, like the way you literally learn it typically in therapy is you, especially if you're in couples therapy ever is your therapist will like, which we're like clearly all a big fan of like, like, I, like I, I say it everywhere we go. Right. Tyler's like, I am, I am therapy advocate. Number one, it's had a massive impact on my own life in a very positive way. And most people would have said that had everything going for me and didn't need therapy. And you could make that argument, but man, I'm a hell of a lot better person 10 years of therapy than without so go get therapy yes i agree (laughs) when you're learning how to do it if you have a good therapist they've probably been paying attention and they can think of a topic that you aren't like gelling on yet and so then basically one person gets to start and you use like i statements when you're talking about yourself like i feel this i think this whatever the issue is And so you wait for the person to be done talking and then you literally say back to them what I'm hearing is, and you said that's even kind of what Eric has done with you. Um, And so then you say back what you're hearing. And what's interesting is you may use different words than the other person, but it uncovers like how you interpreted what they said. And that's how you can get down. And then, so sometimes like I would say, what I'm hearing you say is this. And he'd be like, no. And mm-hmm. so, like, yeah. if you don't do that, you never know yeah. that you're you having miscommunication. You go the whole, that, and that's where the break is. Yeah, yeah, and that that happens in in our marriages, and that's also what happens when we're with, you know, working with our partners in our business and with our clients. Yeah, and when someone feels heard, mm-hmm. it is the most it's the most powerful thing you can give someone, and it, when they feel understood. I, Telling, telling on myself here, went to Kroger the other day to pick up a prescription and it wasn't at the Kroger that I went to. Thought that it was, was told that it was, it was not. Um, I was like, I just wanted the problem solved uh, to try to understand how do I solve this problem? Where is it? How do I pick it up? How do I get it? The, we weren't communicating. The person at the, the pharmacist and I, and the pharmacist was growing increasingly frustrated and then I was growing increasingly more frustrated she said, well, you're going to have to leave if you continue to, um, to, um, if you t- continue to a- act frustrated like this or a- act like mm-hmm. if you continue to act hostile. And I was like, I'm not acting that way. I'm frustrated because I just want to know how do we simply solve the problem? when that person didn't hear my, um, my feeling, my emotion in that conversation, it actually elevated my level of frustration. Right. And so it's like, Hey, how, how, how do we go awry here? Yeah. It's because people stop listening or they listen with their own filter. Right. To, to the way someone feels. I think it's an incredibly challenging skill set that takes a ton of work for people to understand. Yeah. You have to actually understand feelings to know that sounds ridiculous to say you have to understand feelings, but um, I didn't know feelings t- 10 years ago when I showed up. No clue. Yeah. No. I remember being asked, when was the last time you were sad? And I was like, I wore that thing with a badge, man. I'm, I'm like, I got a crown. I'm the champion of the world. I was maybe like <laughs> I'm, six, I'm a badass. five. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't been sad in at least 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that that actually was something men knew how to do. Yeah, so, you suppress it. <laughs> that's that's right. Yeah. And so if you suppress it, you don't actually know how to identify it and listen to it. So I work with these. Um, I work with some kids uh, in Anderson. Um, you know, and they they need some guidance, some mentor, and uh, we a- we asked the guy, the one of the young men. Uh, we asked him, you know, what it was like to be a man. You know, he's a young man. He's coming up probably in his, he's a teenager, 12, 13. He says, um, 
I don't want to be scared. You know, real men aren't scared. And I'm like, bro, I'm scared every day. Yeah, that's right. That's it's right. just like, how do you, how do you handle that? That's right. How, so if we grow up with that condition, condition in our children that you're not supposed to be have fear, and then they experience it, that messes you up. Yeah, yeah. So I think we're teaching our kids the wrong message. Yes, as a man, we can have emotions, we can cry, we can have fear. It's how you handle it. That's right. To wrap up this section, um, on taking ownership and having an ownership attitude, there's four questions that the book outlines that I really like that kind of help clarify um, what results you're going after. Um, one is, what do I need to know in order for this project to be a success? I think that's where it's like you can definitely, one person might think, oh, this is the result we're going for, but actually it might be something completely different. Um, what's the worst case scenario? What are you worried about? So I can take steps to make sure that doesn't happen. What's the best case scenario? What do I need to be working towards? And what's your criteria for success? What standards do I have to make sure I hit for you to have confidence? I think, th I think each of those questions are really good because it is- Yeah, they, they are get tattoo you, that. Uh, yeah, like it's very tattoo everyone, worthy. Yeah. That's <laughs> because what, the, what I think all those questions do a good job of is forecasting what could happen and it also helps tackle any assumptions that could be relevant in the uh, conversation as well you know it also it also um requires both parties to know what success looks like and to get clarity on it otherwise what what happens is you chase frisbees right and, and that's one of the things about being an entrepreneur is you throw out ideas because you see opportunity in everything yeah and so when you throw frisbees to the frisbee catching dog they may try to catch all nine of them simultaneously but nine frisbees may not be the what's required to win maybe you only need to get five of them yeah, yeah. in order to win the frisbee catching dog contest yeah maybe it's the red one and you throw out nine right. and only one of them's red so you're out chasing all nine you need to go get that red one so everyone needs to be in alignment to understand that and it's not exclusively the sender and the leader's responsibility for that for sure